Our next topic is uh, what really matters in grain markets today and tomorrow. And our speaker is Jonathan Dreger. He's a senior market analyst with Left Field Commodity Research. Now, Jonathan uh, joined Left Field in September of 2019, adding his experience to the team's analysis in grain and global crop markets. John has many years of experience in the Canadian ag industry, including a uh, senior market analyst with FarmLink Marketing Solutions, a commodity risk uh, management consultant with a major U.S. brokerage firm, and as econ economist for the Winnipeg uh, Commodity Exchange. John is a Master of Science in Agricultural Economics. John lives near Grunthal, Manitoba with his wife and three daughters. Please welcome John. working? Did that? Oh, now it's really working. Okay. Um, so thanks for that introduction and uh, and thanks everybody for coming. You know, it's uh, actually, you know, what a nice change of pace. We have ag days and it's not minus 5,000 degrees outside. It seems like it's nice. I was the week before and then they just smoke us with minus 30 and wind chill or a storm or something. So it's, it's nice. Uh, Nice weather, a nice day, and it's a great show, and it's a great part to be uh, great to be a part of it. And so, I want to thank the uh, the wheat and barley growers for inviting me to to be part of their session. So, uh, just a real beef background. If anybody's not familiar with Left Field Commodity Research, basically what we do is is we provide market analysis research across the whole whole range of uh, of, of Canadian crops. Uh, and uh, basically most of the research analysis we put out is through some newsletters. We do offer a trial. If anyone's interested, I can give you some details of that afterwards. But, but basically, I guess how we sort of approach uh, markets is, is we really try and, and drill down into the data. You know, we want to try and, and come up with an opinion and, and a thought and, and about these different markets, really backed up by, by actual numbers, by actual data, by actual trends. So that's, that's the approach that we, that we take. And so, you know, in terms of the context of, of sort of the talk here this morning, you know, when I think about, uh, you know, kind of, you know, just getting some sense of where we think is, is, is you know, happening in the markets here going forward, there's so much noise day to day, right? There's so much noise. You guys are getting texts. You guys are getting emails on Twitter or whatever it is, or wherever you're getting your different market information. It just comes bombarding in, bombarding in. And, and often it's really hard to try and sift through the, the noise or the stuff that doesn't matter that much. You know, and, and so kind of, I guess, how I, I wanted to think a little bit about uh, uh, our discussion here this morning is, is to, it's really important with all this information that comes in to try and understand a little bit its context in terms of like, like the bigger picture, right? Because, you know, day-to-day -day stuff or whatever, you know, in the longer term, that, a lot of that stuff doesn't really matter or it's just sort of a, a little ripple within, within larger waves. So, you know, in terms of setting up the talk here, this morning, just want to spend actually some time talking about sort of some bigger, wider, broader trends. These are kind of like multi-year trends. And so it's, it's kind of, you know, this, this, this framework within which the day-to-day -day noise and news and all that kind of stuff sort of falls under. So I think it's important when we think beyond just, oh, am I going to price grain next week or, you know, is the elevator going to hit my target in the next two weeks on oats or something like that. You know, yeah, day-to-day -day news is, is, you know, important in that context. Uh, but when we think about longer term, we've got to think about some of these bigger picture things. So, so that's kind of where, uh, where I wanted to, to go spend a little bit of time in more, a little more detail talking about some of these bigger picture things. And then we'll touch on some individual crop markets, just kind of what we're seeing maybe over the next few months and some thoughts as we head into new crop here. So, so that, that's, kind of, that's kind of where we're going. Reduce global appetite for trade. You know, this, this is a, a really unfortunate trend that we've seen over the last few years. Everybody's farm has been, has been hit by it. And uh, so I guess, here's, I guess, a, a, so as much as we want to maybe be a bit optimistic because, oh, China, US, they sort of, you know, signed their phase one deal or whatever it is, and all the ambiguity and questions still open on that. Uh, but okay, well, that's, that's kind of a good news piece. And, you know, this uh, North American trade agreement, whatever string of letters in whatever order, whatever country wants to use them in. But, you know, okay, that's kind of weaving its way through the various governments. These are positive things. But I guess really, I guess my fear, my concern is, is that this broader environment of sort of slap up trade barriers or tariffs first and ask questions later, I don't think that that's going away. 
I think that that is a trend that's going to continue on. And as much as we've had a little bit of a, you know, a couple pieces of good news in these last couple of weeks, I think we're going to continue on and off to just keep running into these things probably more than we, we used to. And so here's a, a, just kind of the top six economies in the world from one through six. You know, U.S., China, the obvious ones, Japan, Germany, India, U.K. Of the six largest economies in the world, Four of them are led by what you would describe maybe as sort of nationalist, kind of strongmen leaders that, yeah, trade is fine on my terms, right? Trade is fine on our terms, whatever works best for my country, and absolutely no qualms about slapping up tariffs or barriers or whatever it is, if that suits their own domestic political base and, and you know, not a whole lot of respect for the WTO as an institution and that sort of thing, right? Four of the six biggest economies. And, and that is a reflection of, of the attitudes of, of the people in a lot of these countries. And so, you know, as long as that is the case, as much as it's nice to have a couple of pieces of good news come in over the last period of time here, we're going to keep running into these things. And, and I think that's horribly unfortunate. I think that's, you know, misguided from a policy perspective. And it's going to happen anyway. When, when has misguided policy ever stopped you know, governments from doing something, right? So, so this is a trend that's going to, going to continue, unfortunately. We just, got to, we just got to accept it, prepare for it, and, and, and know that that's the case, right? So, you know, for now, it seems like there's a bit of a lull in that, in that U.S.-China trade dispute. But I think we're kidding ourselves if we think that this isn't going to continue to kind of rear its head. I think that with the U.S. and China, the trade aspect is just one part of a much larger geopolitical chess game that's going on between these two countries. We as Canadians, and especially you know, in the agriculture industry in Western Canada, we're just small pawns within a much larger game that's going on. And so there's a bit of a lull in the tensions. I think it's probably inevitable that at some point we start you know, kind of back and forthing again in a little bit. So, so that, is, that is certainly a risk, and that's a, that's a, that's a dynamic that I don't think is, is going to probably get a whole lot better. I mean, it will ebb and flow, but it won't go a whole lot better. There's all kinds of other disputes as well, right? We have, you know, for example, between the U.S. and EU, and so that's impacting, uh, uh, you know, U.S. dry bean exports to the EU. Well, that's helping our exports to, to the EU. So sometimes these, these trade disruptions actually, you know, can work in our favor if we're not on the receiving end and something else opens up. That certainly really helped our exports of barley to, uh, uh, to, to China because China and Australia are, are, you know, having a bit of a tit-for-tat. You know, pulses, of course, India is such a hugely important market. Uh, from a pulse perspective, and you know their policies on you know there's tariffs, there's uh, quotas. Sometimes they seem or feel a little bit arbitrary or those sorts of things. That's just a fact of life, right? That's just a fact of life, and, and that that dynamic's not going to change. So that's that's a longer term trend that we we need to kind of keep uh, keep in the back of our minds when we're thinking, you know, thinking thinking further out. Growing global competition. There is more and more production that is being uh, uh, that is coming out of places like South America, the Black Sea region. That trend also is not going to change anytime soon. We're going to have record large South American soybean production this year. Uh, Russia, Ukraine, you know, their, their farming practices are improving, they're investing in infrastructure, so it's becoming more efficient to be able to get that crop to ports, to be able to export it. We're just simply going to see more and more competition. And by the way, places like Russia and Ukraine growing more and more crops and it's that we in Western Canada used to kind of own from an export perspective, and now less so, right? More peas being grown, you know, lots of barley being exported. Uh, so more and more, more and more competition, Durham, stuff like that. Uh, we're just North America, from a North American perspective, we're just relatively less important than, uh, than we used to be. And these countries are willing to be really, really aggressive in terms of the pricing at which they're, which they'll, they're, they're willing to export at. Okay? And so that's just an uh, a, uh, a, a increasing competitive threat that's not going away anytime soon. So here's a, just a couple of graphs, South American soybean production. Uh, it's going to be record large this year. It seems like these guys never have a problem, right? So if, you're, if your marketing plan for soybeans is we'll wait for that weather wreck in South America, that's a crappy way to approach it because it's like these guys almost never have a serious weather problem, right? I mean, yeah, here and there, sometimes there's a bit of a blip and that sort of thing. At the end of the day, very rarely do they run into a significant weather problem. Here's wheat production in Russia and Ukraine. So it's down a little bit from what it was in 2017. 2017 was a monster crop, right? But the general trend going in one direction. Again, wheat markets get a little bit excited. Oh, it's a bit dry in Ukraine. It's a bit dry in southern Russia. What is that going to do for the winter wheat crop? Everybody always worries about the winter wheat crop. 
spring weather will be the most important. I mean, that region is a little more prone for, you know, for some droughts and dry spells. So it's, it's, uh, it's a little more possible than, for example, hoping for a drought in Brazil or something like that. But the trend is going in, the trend is going in one direction. Here's a graph of uh, non-U.S. corn export volumes. So the U.S. used to, you know, just overwhelmingly dominate global corn exports. And you can see that between Argentina, Brazil, and Ukraine, again, maybe down a little bit this past year, but you know, that trend towards those countries just having a much, much bigger footprint from, uh, from a global export perspective in terms of volumes in corn, that's not gonna change anytime soon, right? And so, okay, now that means that U.S. Is, is a little less competitive in global corn markets. And for example, one of the things that's been weighing on corn futures a little bit, and, and corn is such a hugely influential crop, right? The ripple effects spill into soybeans, wheat, into everything. This is going to be a bit of a headwind for corn prices because the U.S. is just going to have a harder time, you know, kind of muscling its way into, 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 into global export markets. Again, trend isn't going away anytime soon. So that's something we've got to just keep at the back of our minds here a little bit. Question about rising food inflation. And I put a question mark because, uh, uh, you know, whether this is something that really is, is more of a, a, you know, a temporary thing or is this thing actually going to have some legs to it. And I, I guess I don't, you know, know if I, I feel real strongly that this is the case, but I think it's something we've got to be really, really watchful for is are we seeing an uptick in, in food inflation? Uh, and so, for example, in December, the, uh, the, the UN's FAO showed, you know, just a real, a real increase in, in food inflation globally from their, from their food, food inflation index, uh, li- driven, you know, primarily by vegetable oil. As we'll see a little bit later on, vegetable oil markets have been really strong. You know, that's, that's been, you know, a bright spot in terms of helping canola prices a little bit, and that's a bit of a bright spot here in markets. You know, meat prices, of course, with the uh, African swine fever, that's a bit of a, an interim thing. You know, but, but if this is actually something that is going to start getting a little bit more traction from a food inflation perspective, you know, that, that really changes things. So we, we've gone through this period where... Uh, where prices, you know, for, for commodities, and you think about grains in particular, kind of grinding along in kind of a sideways fashion and not really going anywhere, uh, it, you know, and from a fundamental perspective globally, that, that's, probably, that's probably fair, right? Demand has generally been pretty good. There's been adequate supply for most crops. Not a lot of reason for markets to really, you know, rally a whole lot. Not a lot of reason for markets to kind of fall below a certain threshold. Demand is there. So you just kind of make time a little bit. One of the things that does is it creates an awful lot of complacency for end users, for buyers, for importers, because you know markets just kind of make time and there's not that real threat or, or, or that sort of thing. And so if we are going to actually start to see a pickup in food inflation in a meaningful way, that starts to shift psychology, right? That starts to shift end user psychology. It starts to shift the psychology of, of importing countries. Now, instead of, oh, you know, I'm not too worried about getting coverage today because the price probably isn't going anywhere. Now there's a little bit more of a buy the dip kind of mentality, right? There's maybe a little more urgency to make sure that you got coverage and you got supplies of, of food, right? There's nothing that strikes civil unrest in some of these developing countries like food inflation, right? And, and food security. And so, you know, psychology starts to shift a little bit. So I think this is one of those things that we're going to be keeping a real close eye on. You know, again, maybe some of these things are a little bit temporary, temporary that have been popping that market or that, that index higher. Uh, something we're going to keep a real close watch on. So this is just, again, that, that headline FAO food price inflation soars to a five-year high in December, right? And, and it's the kind of thing that gets splashed across headlines all over the place. All the news agencies pick it up. So something I think to really, really keep an eye on because, again, it's one of those things that kind of starts to shift sentiments, shift psychology a little bit, and, and that does have an impact on, on, on prices. There's, there's sort of maybe a bit more of an underlying bid, if you will, in the, in the market. Our commodity index is starting to turn higher a little bit in general. You should, certainly wouldn't necessarily guess it a whole lot by looking at this chart. Again, this, so, so this is one Sachs commodity index. It's basically a basket of a whole bunch of different commodities that they sort of mash together in an index, similar like a stock index, except it's a whole bunch of different commodity prices. And you can see we've kind of been drifting around, going, going nowhere for, for years. And so, you know, based on that, you know, okay, we're up a little bit, but still, you know, certainly decidedly in, you know, kind of a sideways range making time. So, you know, certainly there's nothing in this that would be particularly alarming, you know, but these two graphs I here have, so the one on my right, your left, is, is actually a graph of, of gold on that side. This one here to, to my left, your right, would be crude oil. Crude oil's getting, you know, beat up a little bit here this morning. It isn't really taking off, but certainly you look at something like gold, you know, these are 
barometers of, of sort of wider sentiment, I think there's sort of a compelling case why you might actually start to see some upside, uh, a bit of a more upside, sustained move in some of these other commodity markets. What does it have to do with grain markets? You know, directly, not really that much. But if, and again, a certain amount of this is sort of, let's call it sentiment or psychology or just sort of, you know, market feel, if some of these other commodity markets, you know, kind of really start to, to have a sort of a meaningful sustained run, it starts getting outside attention from investment money, stuff like that. Uh, that, you know, is going to spill over into grain markets and suddenly they're going to look at the price of corn and they're going to say, geez, you know, corn is really, really cheap because all these other commodities are going up. Let's put some money into corn or that sort of thing. And so it does, you know, influence where sort of outside speculative money goes. A certain amount of that spill over into grain markets. What does that mean? It'd probably be good for futures markets, but also maybe going to impact a little bit how basis levels behave. Okay, so... I could have kept going, but I figured if the mothership was actually talking to someone here, I didn't want to, you know, them to miss the message. So, we'll, uh, but anyway, so uh, it does it, it's something like that. So, for example, there's a whole bunch of futures money coming into grain futures markets. It's good for grain futures markets. That is going to impact basis levels, though. For example, right? So, how basis levels behave and so forth, stuff like that is going to be impacted. So, again, just something that I think we want to have our antenna up to maybe some shifts in kind of sentiments and trends that would be different than what we've been seeing for the last, you know, four or five odd years. So the last bigger one, and, and so, you know, growing demand for pulses and, and vegetable oils, you know, this, this really is a, a, a real uh, uh, trend growth, you know, globally, right? So this is something that uh, where uh, this, this really is a, is a, let's call it a tailwind, if you will, for these markets. Now, again, in any given year, production's up or, you know, weather's, you know, hits yields a little bit or that sort of thing, there's still going to be ebb and flow. But in terms of just, you know, sort of commodities and markets that have a bit of a tailwind behind them in terms of demand growth, you know, certainly these are, these are a couple of, couple of really good stories, makes them more sensitive to uh, weather threats, those sorts of things. So this is a graph of, of global veg oil demand through the major veg oils. So this would be like uh, palm oil is, is the largest, then soybean oil, rapeseed, sunflower oil be the, the overwhelming majority of global veg oils. That's a pretty strong upward trend. And that trend is, is continuing both from a human consumption standpoint. There's also uh, a few countries that are starting to increase their biodiesel mandates. And so we're actually having sort of a window here where uh, uh, actually veg oil demand growth is increasing faster than production growth. You know, and so that tightens up the market. And that's part of the reason, and we'll look at some charts here uh, a little bit later on, but that's actually part of the reason, as much as it doesn't feel like canola has been holding up fairly well, from a futures market perspective, actually canola prices have hold, held up quite well relative to some other markets. And, and, and part of that is, uh, is, is sort of this underlying strength in, in veg oil prices. It certainly helped crush margins. That's why our, our domestic crush here for canola is, is going to set a new record again this year. So uh, this is a graph. It's not a very good looking graph. You, you don't have very good uh, uh, sort of aggregate information on, on global pulse demand and projections and stuff like that. But again, just a bit of a, you know, this is one, one group's estimate of, of demand growth for pulses. And, and again, it's, it's going in one direction. It's a, it's a pretty 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 strong trend and so you know again it's it's a, a broader trend that, that's a positive one uh, for for markets here in general so that's just kind of some some big big picture things and again I, I think it's important to spend a little bit of time on that because these are sort of the longer term trends that you know that are going to be in place here going forward or potentially in the process of turning you know it's the kind of stuff that uh, isn't going to you know in a market outlook sometimes you feel like by the time you get to the parking lot it's stale because there's some new news item that came in or or you know some man with a bad orange comb over tweets something and suddenly oh the market isn't rallying it's collapsing or stuff like this this stuff transcends all that kind of noise so you know I think it's important to kind of keep some of those things in in mind, even when we're thinking about, you know, a few months out, how you're going to market the next crop, stuff like that. So getting into uh, some more crop specific uh, comments and thoughts here. So just in general, we actually have a market where we're seeing pretty good demand actually for most crops. Okay. So most crops sort of, we think about it from a global perspective, demand has been pretty good, uh, but supplies aren't that tight. 
right? So it sort of lends itself to kind of this sort of range-bound trade. You know, there's an element of firmness, and you rally up to the top end of a range, and then, oh, it kind of sort of rolls over, but then you find some support. And, and then that's probably a little bit how we sort of expect to see, if you're going to overgeneralize, you know, maybe the next, next few months here going forward. Uh, Again, you know, the wider geopolitical macroeconomic forces remain issues. So it's, it's kind of like if you looked at it just from a green fundamental perspective, probably range-bound trade with a little bit of a caveat because there's just, uh, you know, there's probably more risk and uncertainty in sort of these wider geopolitical macroeconomic things than there is maybe just kind of specifically in grain market fundamentals. So that, that's kind of a little bit, you know, how we, how we see it across the whole, whole matrix. So looking a little bit specifically at wheat, this is a graph of global wheat ending stocks. Right, so if you just sort of look at the headline number of global wheat ending stocks, there's a lot of wheat around in the world, right? Nothing to worry about here, lots of supplies, uh, going to be record large. Would look pretty bearish on the surface. However, and this is one of the things that's really important, is, is that what matters enormously is where those stocks are. Okay, so the blue graph, the blue bar on the bottom, is the stocks that are not in China. You know, and the red bar is, is, is stocks that are, that are in China. Okay, so, so China represents over half of that great big number. And so if you actually look at non-Chinese stocks, suddenly that doesn't quite look so heavy and so burdensome anymore. And actually, if we drill down a little bit further and looked at stocks specifically in the key exporters, you know, it's a little bit tighter yet. Okay, so we actually have a market where, as despite the headline number being so bearish, you know, record large world stocks, ending stocks, uh, it's actually behaving pretty good. This is a little bit of a noisy graph, but this is basically milling wheat prices across a whole bunch of key exporting countries. Okay, it's been trending higher. You know, it's been actually in a pretty nice trend higher, even through the fall. You know, when normally you might see a little bit of pressure on prices coming out of harvest. You know, so whether it's it's Europe, Russia, U.S., Australia, Canada is in there those export prices have been moving higher, right? So certainly not a market that's behaving like, oh, we're crushed with these massive stocks and what are we going to do with them, okay? This is a reflection of, of both, again, good demand from a lot of these importing countries and maybe there's an element of, again, sort of this food inflation, food security prices going up component that maybe makes them anxious to get some coverage and the fact that stocks are a little bit tighter if you look across the exporting, sort of across all the different exporting countries. Okay, so if apparently prices are moving higher. Why is it that feels like, you know, kind of spring wheat prices kind of stink a little bit, you know, because, I mean, who can sit there and say, oh, I feel so great about how wonderful spring wheat prices have been behaving in Western Canada this year? You know, a big part of the reason is that spring wheat, unfortunately, is one of those markets that is relatively heavier supplied compared to some other types of wheat. So this particular graph here is U.S. wheat ending stocks. So hard red winter wheat is by far the largest... Uh, 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 component of, of U.S. production and, and, and exports. And so you can see, actually, for hard red winter wheat, you know, it's kind of, you know, ending stocks over the course of a several years has been declining. And so, you know, they're still, you know, not tight by any stretch of the imagination, but they've definitely been trending a little bit lower, and, you know, that, that would be somewhat supportive to prices. If you look at the, the lighter shaded blue stocks, uh, or the bars, which are kind of, uh, you know, right next to the dark blue one, also trending lower, and that's soft red winter wheat, okay? And so, you know, those are the kinds of, of uh, graphs that traders look at and say, oh, you know, let, let's, let's buy wheat futures because, you know, wheat's getting tighter, that sort of thing. Unfortunately, the green bars is the hard red spring wheat stocks in the U.S., and they're, they're, they're pretty large, right? They're pretty large. So from a spring wheat, sort of a hard red spring wheat perspective, the market looks at this and says, yeah, you know what, we're not too, too worried about hard red spring wheat because... You know, there's lots of supplies here in the U.S. And, and so from a futures market perspective, that's why we're having this sort of this weird thing where Minneapolis is actually trading at a discount to Chicago. Shouldn't happen. It is happening. And, you know, this would be certainly one part of it. It's a little bit more complicated than that, but certainly that's, that's, that's a pretty key component. They look at a tightening soft red winter wheat uh, ending stocks, which is the Chicago contract. They look at lots of spring wheat, and so then Minneapolis unfortunately lags a little bit, which spills over into our prices, you know, maybe not behaving how we would like them to behave. This is a graph of Canadian non-Durham wheat production by grade, okay? And basically, just want to illustrate here, so the, so the red and the yellow would be 1CW and 2CW, and so you can see in most years, you know, you'd probably have a crop that, you know, call it two-thirds, three-quarters, you know, would be in the top two grades. Uh, this year, it's going to be maybe half, right? So, and, and nothing that you guys don't know or, or have experienced, right, in terms of just the difficulty with getting quality off, but this is just sort of, you know, from an overall production perspective, yeah, we grew a lot of wheat, and unfortunately, there's a lot of it that, that just wasn't, wasn't that good from a quality perspective. 
This is just a graph actually of Canadian wheat exports by grade and just illustrating that actually the bulk of it goes out as a 2CW, okay, so as much as uh, a certain chunk of it certainly is 1CWRS, one, one most of it does go out as a 2CW and so uh, it's not actually mostly number one that we ship. You know, still good quality, still good quality wheat, but uh, um, just a reflection of the fact that most of it actually goes out as a number two. So the problem here that we have in Canada is besides the fact that, uh, uh, you know, Minneapolis has, has been kind of, you know, a bit, quite frankly, a bit disappointing as a, as, a, as a futures market. You know, it's like, oh, geez, don't these guys know all the trouble we're having up here and we're losing yield or we're using quality that should be good for Minneapolis futures? Well, as we mentioned, you know, that's, you know, that hasn't been helping us out. The other thing is, you know, our, our, our wheat exports are off to actually a really crappy start, to be quite frank about it. So this is weekly CGC exports of wheat. And so, you know, the bars, you know, kind of leading up to just show sort of week in, week out. And so relative to the line, which was last year, 2018, 19, lagging that by a huge amount and, you know, kind of average-ish maybe from a historical perspective, but certainly not the kind of volumes that we need to see if we want to start seeing better basis levels, you know, in a meaningful way, start pulling those bids higher. We've got to try and get some better movement on these wheat exports out of Canada if we kind of want to really see a meaningful, meaningful move higher in, in wheat prices. And so far, we have not been seeing that yet in the, in the data. So I'm, I'm hopeful and optimistic that we might start to see some better movement. You know, that should start showing up in some better bids at, at elevators. We do hear from, from some clients and some folks out in the country that here and there you're starting to maybe see some better programs going, some better pricing, you know, so I'm hoping that that's a bit of an indication of, you know, where the data catches up and shows some better volumes. But, man, if we want to see, you know, kind of that, that next leg higher in wheat prices for what matters most to you guys, bids at the elevator, uh, we got to get some, we got to get some export business going. This is just a graph of hard red spring wheat basis, and, and again, so the green line just shows Canadian, Western Canadian basis levels just haven't been very good, right, compared to, for example, North Dakota, you know, which actually is, uh, uh, their basis levels have behaved a lot better relative to the last couple of years compared to ours. So we've really been lagging, and again, uh, you know, just a reflection of that, that slow start to exports. This is a graph of, of ending stocks for Canadian wheat. I, I, you know, it got quite you know, very tight last year. We, we had a huge export program last year. So one of the things you have to be a little careful of was when you think about, oh, you know, what are export volumes compared to last year? Last year we knocked it out of the park in terms of volume, so it's a pretty tough bar to, uh, it's a little bit like the Jets defense, right? I mean, these guys are bleeding goals, but, you know, if you compare it to the six guys you had in the blue line last year compared to what we dressed last night, it's a bit of a tough comparison, and maybe that's a little bit how it is with, with wheat, but... I guess also like the Jets defense, if they end up putting someone else back on that blue line, it ain't getting any better. And so, you know, we got to get some better exports going here too. So uh, anyway, we, we look for a little bit of a bounce in, in ending stocks here. Looking for, ahead to next year, you know, so one of the things that's helped a little bit with wheat this last year is, you know, we sort of have a bit of a dip in production, which is that blue line, where it's sort of, you know, dip below global usage. The likely scenario here going forward is, is, is that we're probably going to, you know, kind of shift that a little bit where we once again maybe actually outproduce what we, uh, what we, uh, what we can expect from a demand perspective. Again, spring weather is, is critical. Uh, so we think about the Black Sea region, we think about the U.S., we think about Europe. You know, that spring weather ultimately is, is the most important thing. But, you know, barring some, some weather wrecks or some concerns, you know, we probably... Uh, uh, we feel okay about wheat prices in, the, in sort of the next few months, but next year, you know, really is going to be a big function of, of, of weather. So, oh, that, you know, in terms of acreage next year, we, so we expect wheat acres to be down about a million in Canada next year, and actually it'll be down more than that when we think about spring wheat specifically, because actually winter wheat acres were up a little bit. So that's kind of, kind of some thoughts we have on, on wheat. We talked a little bit about quality with wheat, and, and so basically what this graph shows is just the amount of the, the different cereals that actually were of feed quality, you know, at least as, as best guess according to, you know, for example, CGC or some of the prov provinces that put out great estimates. Just showing how much of, of what we grew in, in Western Canada this last year sort of falls into the, falls into the feed grain categories. So we talked a little bit about barley specifically here. You know, lots of barley was growing. Uh, of course, you know, not as much of it was as malt, again, just a reflection of the, of the quality issues. But we think about barley, obviously the fact that we just have all this feed grain in Western Canada that we grew, uh, you know, it's a bit of a, a bit of, feed grains are substitutable, right? So if barley price gets a little bit too far ahead of itself, then people just start feeding more wheat or, or that sort of thing. And so that's, that's a little bit of a headwind for barley. Um, 
Our exports actually for barley have been pretty good. We've been keeping up with last year's pace. China has been a big buyer of that. We've sort of benefited a bit from uh, both, first of all, the, the droughts in Australia and some spats that they've had. So that's been, that's been a positive thing for barley. This is a graph of bar Chinese imports of barley. So their pace is actually slower than what it used to be uh, or has been. Uh, but we're getting a good chunk of that. So this is a matter of where China is buying less but we're actually getting, I guess, a bigger slice of that pie, and so that's really helped our, helped our movement here for, for barley. So there's a graph of just uh, uh, major or, or barley production through the major exporting countries. It was a bit of a smaller carry-in, but production was pretty high, and, and again, looking ahead to next year, you know, it's, it's, we'll probably see production stay at a fairly good level. We think barley acres will probably be down a little bit here in Western Canada. Not a huge drop, but maybe down a little bit in Western Canada next year, but Again, ultimately, uh, most of it gets consumed domestically. So, you know, again, the comfortable, heavy Canadian feed grain supply situation is, is just going to be just going to be a bit of a headwind. Um, U.S. corn less competitive, right? So, one of the things you know, last year we imported a whole whack of U.S. corn, and part of it is because actually our, our feed grain market last year was tight because we had pretty good pretty good harvest, right? Pretty good quality. There was less feed quality grain. Now that there's all this feed grain hanging around here in Western Canada, it makes, makes U.S. corn less competitive. So we'll have less of it, less of it coming in from down south. Um, from a price perspective, again, just kind of that last bullet point, probably flattish. Tend to be a little bit of a seasonal bump in feed barley prices. You know, as we get kind of into that, into that spring season, we may still see that. But I think there's limited upside for feed barley. Just, again, you know, a big part of that is just a function of, uh, of, of just lots of feed grain supplies. Shifting gears to oats a little bit, you know, we got a, had a big crop. Uh, we didn't have much of a carryout though, so when we think about from a total supply perspective, it's not actually that much higher than it was last year, again, because it was pretty tight coming in. That's helped offset uh, the fact that we had a big crop. Also, uh, the quality of the harvest was down with oats, so when we think about the volume of, you know, kind of better quality oats, actually is, is even tighter yet. And that's part of the way we actually have ourselves, a, you know, some pretty good hope prices this year. And, and so that's been a real, uh, you know, that, that's, that's been a blessing. That's been good that, that oats has been a pretty good, pretty good story. One of the neat things with oat exports, we're starting to, I mean, the, the U.S. is still by far overwhelmingly the most important, largest market for our oats, like, like hands down. That's not going to change, but we are starting to get some volumes moving to a few other countries a little bit. So we're, we're kind of diversifying our markets from an export perspective a little bit. There's a limit as to how much we're able to do that, but certainly it's, you know, the more places we can sell it to, the less reliant we are to one market. That's a positive thing. This is a graph of, of U.S. Uh, uh, oat production and imports. And again, just a reflection of the fact that, you know, their import needs are, are up this year, right? So, 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 so supplies of good quality oats are fairly tight. U.S., our main market, needs to buy more of it, you know, and, and that's, what's, uh, that's what's keeping our market pretty well supported here. One of the things that also helped last year, actually, is the fact that uh, that Europe really, uh, you know, had a had a real setback in their production. So this graph is is Swedish and Finnish oat production, and one of the things that's always kind of kept a lid on our oat prices often, and the ability to really export as aggressively as I think we might into the U.S. is that at a certain point. If our prices get too high, they would just buy a whole bunch of cheap oats from Scandinavia, especially if the euro's weak and freight weight rates are low, and that sort of kept the ceiling on prices. That dynamic wasn't there last year because their own crop was so small. And so that kind of helped, helped our, our, our ability to export and maintain some, some high prices. Uh, the fact that they have a rebound in production this last year, again, just sort of opens that, it just kind of provides that ceiling, right? It provides that ceiling a little bit. And so as much as we, you know, feel okay about oat prices going forward, uh, probably not as much upside as one might think if we just looked, say, at our own balance sheet, partially because there's sort of this, uh, call it a bit of a release valve almost, if you will, as a pressure on prices. If prices get too high, we'll just see some more of it come in from, from, from Scandinavia. This is a graph of oat acreage with actually our, our outlook for next year. And this is, I think, where we see some real risk with oats is because we think there's going to be a big bump in acres. And uh, if that's the case, pretty quickly we can make this oat balance sheet look pretty ugly for next crop year. 
Okay, so I guess we, we do feel a little concerned about what these old prices are going to look like. And I think there's some pretty decent bids out there for a new crop. That's something you probably want to take a pretty good look at, in our opinion, because barring a weather problem or a weather wreck, uh, old acres might go up even more than that, sort of based on what we hear anecdotally and based on you know some of the, the, the margin simulations that we run and so forth. So when it comes to oats, we're cautious about what this looks like in terms of just supplies next year, and especially if the quality is half decent, you know that's that's going to be that's going to be real headwind to prices. So that's where that's where we we would have some caution, some risk here as as we look uh, as we look forward. I think I hit most of most of these most of these points here. So again, you know, old crop should hold up fairly firm, but uh, a little concerned about what this looks like once uh, once next year's crop starts coming off, or even being anticipated by buyers. Just going to touch real briefly on corn because I think. Uh, you know, it, it's, uh, um, yeah, so if we look at U.S. ending stocks of corn, and according to the last USDA report, you know, it was kind of coming in at around, you know, 1.8 uh, billion bushels or whatever it is. What does that number mean? Well, you know, look at the trend, I guess, basically what we're looking at is, is a fairly, you know, at least going in the right direction in terms of ending stocks and, and prices. And so, you know, that, you know, on its own, you'd say it might suggest that we should see some better prices for corn here going forward. Uh, but two things. One is we talked a little bit about, you know, so, so U.S. corn exports actually have been pathetic. And part of it is some of that, that global competition that we've had. They might pick up a little bit. There's a bit of a window of opportunity. But here's the thing that I think is, is really uh, a legitimate concern from the market perspective with corn for next year. And that is the fact that the reason that... Um, these ending stocks are down is because there were so many acres that never got planted because of prevent plant. Uh, the U.S. yield last year was uh, uh, was down because of challenging growing conditions. And so, you know, based on expectations for corn acres next year, and who knows how that's going to shake out, we don't get an official USDA survey number until the end of March, but based on what people are thinking corn acres could be, and a return to anything resembling normal yield, that corn carryout for next year could look something like this. Or at least that is the concern from a market perspective. And that is not a happy place from a price perspective if that is ultimately what the corn balance sheet would look like. Now, I mean, there's all kinds of assumptions in there. There's all kinds of things that got to happen. They got to plant it. They got to grow it. You know, if you listen to Drew, Drew Lerner yesterday, it's, oh, maybe late spring and blah, 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 all that kind of stuff. So you're probably going to maybe have those windows, uh, windows of, of, uh, of, of, you know, market scares, weather scares, all that kind of thing. But if this is kind of where we're potentially trending in terms of ending stocks for corn, that's not a happy place. And that spills over in everything else. Okay, so that is, again, I've known that that would say that this is our forecast or our prediction, but that's sitting in the back of, of the market's mind when they look ahead to what could happen with corn next year. So that, too, is, is a real, is a real uh, uh, caution that we have here when we think about corn in particular. Speaking a little bit about canola. So this is a graph of, of canola supplies. Uh, production was down but we had a larger old crop carry-in, so total supply is very similar. Of course, there's a chunk of it that's unfortunately still left out in the field, right? So from a market perspective, I think the market is assuming that those, those bushels and, and that production will make it in, kind of work its way into the system, uh, but that's kind of what the supply situation looks like. This is canola exports by month. Uh, a bit of a slow start, uh, which isn't great. It's also part of the reason why one of the reasons why basis levels kind of lagged so much kind of, you know, really up until, well, they're still a bit, they're still a bit soft right now, quite frankly. Uh, we feel okay about actually canola exports going forward. Uh, we're going to, we think we're, we already saw, you know, for example, last week's CGC, there was, uh, you know, had a good week, uh, some supplies building up in the system, which would suggest that maybe there's a few more weeks going forward. We feel okay about, about canola exports here going forward. And again, that should start maybe helping uh, in terms of basis levels at the elevator, right? So that's, that's something we're, we're anticipating here going forward. This is a graph of Canadian col canola exports to China. And so, you know, the bars are, are the months so far. This crop year, the green line is what we saw last year. And, and so uh, the dash line is sort of that five-year average, right? So consistently month in, month out, we, they'd buy 250 to 400,000 tons. And of course, last year at about this time, completely hit a wall. They are still buying, right? So to say that China is buying no canola, you know, that would not be an accurate statement. Actually, uh, you know, they still are actually one of our largest uh, customers. It's just they're taking less than a third of what they normally would, right? So uh, 
Again, nothing here that, that we, don't, we don't already know. Uh, but, you know, within all of this, um, you know, sometimes it gets thrown around, well, China's not buying, who on earth is going to buy it? It's like, well, there actually are some other people that are buying more canola than they have been. So this is a graph of, of Canadian canola exports to the UAE, right? Now, actually, what they're doing is crushing a lot of this and sending the oil to China, right? So China is kind of, in a way, sort of indirectly buying some of our canola by importing oil from the UAE. Again, does this make up for the, the China not buying? Not even close. Uh, does it help? Sure it does, right? You know, they've, so they've been buying quite a bit more than they have been. Here's also, so here's a graph of EU rapeseed imports, right? And they've actually been importing record volumes of, of rapeseed. So this is from all destinations. This isn't just, uh, this isn't just, just Canada. Uh, but, but just a bit of a reflection of how their crop was really short. And, you know, they're a big importer. And, and now whether this pace will continue all the way through, that's maybe a little too aggressive. But I think most forecasts would say that they still got to buy quite a bit. And that in the context of uh, uh, world production of, of sort of rapeseed and canola that was down from last year, there's not a whole lot of canola out there that they can buy from aside from us. Okay, and so, you know, we feel pretty optimistic. We've already been seeing volumes of Canadian canola to Europe up quite, you know, substantially. And we're going to see that going forward here a little bit. So that's also a positive news story from an expert perspective. So again, I mean, nothing's going to sit there and replace the fact that China is not buying the way they used to. But there's a few things here that are helping a little bit. Here's a graph of Canadian oil exports, canola oil exports. And, and again, you know, on a pretty good trend, not necessarily sort of pop, you know, poking your eye out the way some of these other charts do, but it's, uh, you know, on a, on a pretty good trend and a chunk of that is going to canola or to, to China. So this is a graph of, of canola rapeseed prices across a bunch of different destinations. And so the one that's, that's really lagging at the bottom, that's Vancouver, right? So we've been trading at a huge discount compared to, for example, uh, European prices, uh, Australian prices and so forth. And so this is also one of the reasons why we feel okay about canola exports is because actually Canadian and canola is, is still pretty good value, right? We're still pretty good value. And so that price spread on its own also should suggest that Europe say, hey, there's pretty good value there. We're going to try and fill some of our needs and, and buy some Canadian canola. So, you know, that's, that's also, I think, something that we're encouraged a little bit from, uh, from a, an export perspective. This is the graph of, of Canadian, or sorry, of global canola rapeseed production. And it's, it's just, you know, it's now it's for the third year in a row, it's down. It's going to be up a bit next year, right? Australia should rebound next year. And, and I think European production should be up a little bit next year if, if their yields recover. But certainly from an overall global perspective, sort of canola slash rapeseed is, you know, it's, it's on the tighter side. Does that make me raging bullish canola? No, that's, you know, barring a China announcement, that's, that's more, I don't want to be uh, misleadingly optimistic. Uh, but we feel okay about, about prices, and certainly at a minimum, you know, they should, should, hold, up, should hold up okay. This is a graph of China, uh, Chinese rapeseed crush in stocks, just a reflection of just how tight their stocks are. They're not getting the canola from somewhere else, right? It's not like, oh, you know, they didn't buy it from Canada, we didn't miss a beat. Uh, extremely tight, right? Extremely tight. So they're still buying some from us dribs and drabs, or buying some oil, you know, either from us, you know, some from the UAE and so forth, but, but they're just sort of, sort of making do with, with uh, just really limited volumes. They're, they're not getting it from somewhere else. So this is a graph of actually vegetable oil prices in China. Now, I, 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 this graph is from about a week ago. You know, we have rolled over a little bit. We're seeing vegetable oil prices correct downward a little bit. They've gotten a little bit, a little bit frothy, right? You're seeing it in soybean oil, palm oil, and so forth. But, but again, just a reflection of the fact that vegetable oil prices, and whether you're looking at graphs in, you know, out of Europe, out of China, that sort of thing, vegetable oil prices have been really, really strong. This is a pretty tight market globally. Also, again, within all this helps underpin, you know, canola prices. So um, this is a graph of our crush of canola, record large crush. We're going we're gonna to have a record large crush this year of canola. Again, helped by those strong veg oil prices, crush margins are good. You know, thank goodness that we got the crushing industry and capacity that we do in Western Canada because they've been banging through a whole bunch of that stuff and they've been the leader with, with bids to you guys, right, for, for most, of the, most of the year. This is our graph of ending stocks for canola, and, and so basically our expectations is about 3 million tons into this year. Uh, you know, there, I mean, there's a wide range of estimates with canola, and I guess that's probably fair because there's just a lot of uncertainty, you know, the whole China situation, all these different things that are going on, uh, you know, uncertainty about crop size, crop that's left in the field, there's all these different dynamics, so it really is a harder one this year than ever to try and peg but, you know, you do get some estimates out there that are, you know, 6 million tons, 7 million tons, those sorts of things. I think those are way too pessimistic. I think those are way too pessimistic. I, we feel pretty good about our 3 million tons. And also, sometimes when you're in doubt, 
There's nothing like market behavior and market action to try and, you know, kind of, you know, reaffirm or confirm or maybe show you you're a total idiot because the market's telling you something totally different. Futures prices are holding up okay. You know, basis levels are low, but we think we're seeing some signs of them turning a little bit. You know, that's not the behavior of a, of a market that is, you know, six, seven million tons of canola left at the end of the crop year. So, uh, yeah, I think I hit off all, all these points. So let's, let's keep rolling here. So here's soybeans, U.S. acreage, and, and yield. And, and uh, again, similar story to what would have been the case in corn if I were to throw it up the same, same graph for corn. Basically, just the idea that acres and yield were down last year because of, of their late spring, challenging growing conditions, and, and, and so forth. This is a graph of U.S. soybean ending stocks, right? So, I mean, last year it was just ridiculously high. I think we sometimes forget, you know, we sort of went through like a decade where actually soybean ending stocks are pretty tight, like year in, year out. And it was like every single year USDA predicts ending stocks and then that number grinds lower, grinds lower, grinds lower over the course of the year. So it's like, holy moly, that's a pretty tight market. And, you know, soybean prices have been pretty high. You know, and we sort of, you know, canola sort of rode those co coattails, had, their own had its own story, but certainly riding the coattails of, of a pretty sexy soybean market for a long period of time. And now that those stocks have built up, you know, that's no longer the case. And so, you know, as much as, uh, as you know, it's nice to see those ending stocks get cut like in half for soybeans, still not a very tight market. And again, can't overemphasize how much of this is the fact that production, you know, really took an unusual hit last year. And if we see some return to normal for acres and for yield next year, it's pretty tough to get too, too excited about soybean futures prices in the U.S., this is global soybean ending stocks, again, heading a bit in the right direction, but we also have a record large South American production, and, you know, the U.S. was sort of, let's say, artificially low last year. This is a graph of U.S., uh, of, of, sorry, of, of soybean imports into China, and had really been lagging, and now the last couple of months they've started to pick up their, their volumes here a little bit, and so that's a positive, you know, some talk about maybe they're starting to rebuild their, their uh, uh, they're, they're swine herds a little bit, some of those things. So, you know, if they start buying, maybe it's a norm market that returns to a bit of a more sort of quote-unquote normal environment, especially with this phase one trade deal, which again, as I think, has, it leaves as many questions as it does answers, but maybe a step in the, in the right direction. Problem with soybeans for us here in Western Canada, our exports have been just terrible. Right, our exports have been terrible. That's showing up in your guys' basis levels. We're just not getting the movement. You know, we're at best a residual supplier for soybeans globally. And as long as U.S. has supplies, South America has supplies, there's not really a real strong incentive or pull to, to drag it out of Canada here unless they get really, really cheap. Weak basis levels, I think the market is trying to do that. But if we don't start seeing some better export volumes, I, I guess it's, you know, it's hard to be too optimistic about soybean prices here in our own backyard you know, if we aren't getting some, some export movement going. So that's, that's definitely a concern for us for the soybean market. We expect seeded acreage to be roughly maybe up a touch next year. That's going to be in eastern Canada. We'll probably almost certainly be down here in, in Manitoba next year. Eastern Canada will see a bit of a bump. So it's a little bit misleading if you're thinking about, oh, the acres will be up a little bit. If you think about it from a Manitoba perspective, probably not the case. So just going to hit on just a couple of other, other issues here real quickly. You know, African swine fever, I mean, certainly we've had this, this big reduction in demand. So as much as China is, you know, there's a certain amount of posturing and grandstanding and all these things with the U.S. and soybeans and blah, blah, blah. Part of the reason they can do that is because they haven't needed as many, right? Because they've had a whole lot fewer mouths to feed. And so you know, there's been some spillover effects. I don't know if anyone really has a good handle on exactly the impact from a demand perspective. Maybe we're starting around that corner a little bit. And so uh, that's something we'll keep watching. Fund positions, that's always something we, we watch, you know, an element of speculator sentiment. They, they built up a lot of short, you know, in, in the market across the entire complex. A lot of that has been, been unwound, so that's something we continue to watch. And obviously, you know, the weather will be, be a key driver going forward. So uh, just in terms of, of uh, summarizing with maybe a few, few thoughts, you know, again, wheat, barley supplies, you know, pretty comfortable. Uh, not necessarily that bearish per se, but it's hard to get really bullish again with, with Canada. If we can get some export volumes going, that would, that would be a bit of a different story. We need to see that, right? We want to see those basis levels improve here a little bit and, and, and see those cash bids move higher. So that, that's something that's, that's going to, we're going to need some export help. Oats is tighter for now, but that's a finite window. Uh, Pulses, I didn't really talk about pulses uh, here a whole lot. Let's have actually a pretty good story of pulses because we're seeing some really good export business, especially lentils have been surprisingly good. You know, peas are pretty solid, but within all of this, there's still a lot of, lot of uncertainty, uh, which makes walking through the whole process of grinding through these supply and demand numbers just a little bit more of a challenge because a lot of this can get turned on his head because, you know, someone wakes up at two in the morning and, you know, fires off it or something like that that the markets, markets react to. 
But within all of this, um, again, obviously the biggest factor going forward here is weather, which is not anything that is any surprise or new, but you know, obviously the, the thing that, that is going to be the, the single biggest driver. So with that, I think I have time for some questions because I wrapped, uh, ripped through that stuff really, really quick. Uh, so I'd actually be happy to take some questions if, if folks have questions. Uh, we do offer a four-week trial for our newsletters. If anybody is interested, you can either visit the website or shoot me a text or an email. I also have some sheets on the table at the back. So if anyone is interested in taking a look at what we put out, by all means, happy to share that. But uh, I think we do have some time for questions. So if anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to, uh, to take a few because, as I mentioned, I, I kind of blasted through that pretty quick. Yeah. Uh, sorry, what was that? Mm. Yeah, so the, uh, the question was uh, markets for low falling number, number three wheat. And, uh, you know, I think one of the things that has certainly not helped our, our export volume and our export velocity for wheat is the fact that we do have this really variable quality, a lot of lower quality stuff, and certainly that's not conducive to, you know, blasting out unit train after unit train uh, as if, the, if there was, there was a, you know, uniform harvest. And so I guess my feeling on, on that is that... Uh, I would keep my eyes open because from what we hear is, is that there are companies that are working with, uh, you know, some different uh, levels of, say, low falling number, you know, some lower grades, and probably through a number of different ways, maybe some blending, you know, maybe working with some customers that are willing to work with some, some lower falling number. The challenge is I think that falling number isn't as simple to blend as, as some other uh, uh, you know, some other grading uh, issues. So I would say that if a person was sitting at lower falling number, probably how I would approach it is that, you know, I don't give that stuff away. But if there is an opportunity to move it at a reasonable price or someone's got a bit of a program going or that sort of thing, I probably would want to give it a pretty good, a pretty good look. Uh, because chances are, if it's, if it's sort of that lower quality stuff, someone's trying to sort of cobble together a program for a certain destination or that sort of thing, but it might be one of those things where opportunities pop up and then it maybe fades away potentially once it's filled. So, um, you know, I think most of the wheat will ultimately, you know, find a home for it. But certainly, you know, if you've got stuff that's a little bit off grade or whatever it is, uh, you know, I'd be attentive. That's actually one thing, by the way, that probably, uh, I don't know how many buyers, you know, all you talk to on a regular basis, but, you know, even, for example, cash grain brokers sometimes can be really useful in, in some of those situations because they maybe talk to a whole network of buyers that you otherwise wouldn't be in touch with. You know, so if you don't work through a cash grain broker normally, I'd probably check in with some of those guys if you've got some, some wheat that's a little bit off grade, I'm not sitting there saying they can, you know, weave gold out of something that's, you know, not, not the best quality, but... That's a, uh, you know, probably a worthwhile phone call or two to make because they tap into a bunch of markets you probably didn't even think of. So, yeah. Yeah, actually, really, you know, there's a really good comment. For those of you that, that maybe didn't hear the, to hear the question or the comment is, you know, in the past, you used to have all these graphs about, oh, you know, the, the, the world population is exploding and we'll never grow enough food. And how on earth are we ever going to grow enough food for all these people and all that kind of stuff? And everybody talked about it. And all of a sudden, now it's like dead air because it never comes up anymore. And oh, by the way, you know, corn's grinding along at just over three bucks a bushel instead of seven and a half. And it's like, you know, what the heck happened? And, and I guess probably the short answer is, you know, production caught up. You know, I think one of the things that kind of happened, you know, during a period of time when, when uh, that probably was, let's say, a bit of a bigger deal is, is that, you know, we kind of go through some years where, you know, production has a bit of a setback, you know, demand is growing, you know, people extrapolate those trends out into the future and all of a sudden, holy crap, what are we going to do? How are we going to fix this? And all of a sudden, oh, geez, you know, we banged off a few years where there haven't been any real major, major production threats, say, across multiple key countries oh, geez, you know, now we, uh, lo and behold, you guys did a really good job. You grew enough grain and there's enough grain and no one's really that concerned about it. And now no one's talking about this big imminent problem that was supposedly just around the corner and, you know, we're, we're going to start eating each other, right? So um, I think, you know, so there's a couple of things probably. And I would probably say from a production perspective, 
I'm going to say there's a little, maybe a little element of luck almost, if you will, because maybe we just haven't, we've had pretty good weather through most of the regions for a period of time. Now, you might not feel that way if you still got half your canola out in the field, but if you looked at it from a bigger picture perspective, weather has not been that bad. I think the even bigger thing, though, uh, is the fact that, you know, I think just between the technology and genetics and, and you guys doing what you do is that, you know, I think production is a lot more resilient than it used to be for some of the things that would knock yields down in the past. And I have to be honest with you, that actually has created challenges for us as, as analysts going through the growing season because you sit there and go, geez, you know, what are we doing with yields? Because, you know, weather looks tough and it's, oh, it's difficult and, oh, we're losing bushels in the field. Okay, let's start knocking our yield down a little bit. Geez, that changes the outlook. Maybe we should be more bullish to prices. Lo and behold, harvest comes. You guys end up pulling off a whole lot more than you would have thought and then you should have, you know, based on, on the weather. So there's definitely an element of, of that that's, that's in play that's in play as well. So I think a few things going on, but I think that's a fair point. All the stuff that was this massive deal, you know, a number of years ago, and suddenly, oh, no one's, no one's talking about that anymore. What, what happened? It's like, well, we, I guess we grew too much, right? We don't have to be worried about it anymore. So that's, that'd be, I guess, the short answer. <laughs> yeah, it's a good, good point. Yeah. Oh boy, that's a good question. So I was asked, you know, specifically about what kind of a premium someone might get for a really high quality, you know, high protein number one. And so I'm not sure that there is going to be that much more upside in that premium than maybe what what you'd be seeing out there today you know at like like there you know definitely be some some premium but is that going to expand a whole lot further than make what be might be available and i'm not sure that that is necessarily the case or maybe i'm going to qualify that a little bit is that going to be the case on a widespread basis where just the market sort of across a huge area or western canada suddenly these premiums you know explode to the upside i think unless we start getting a threat to this next crop I'm not sure that they'll expand a whole lot more because I think one of the things that that market often does is, is adjust early in the season to reflect what, you know, what, what production is. I think, uh, uh, I think companies do a good job of kind of, and end users, good job of, of sort of using as little as they can get away with, which doesn't mean it shouldn't have premium or have value, but, but I think they can get away with you know, maybe surprisingly little if they have to. And so uh, now, so I qualify that a little bit. What you may have is maybe individual companies or something like that sort of run programs where they get a wider premium because maybe you know, it fits with some lower quality stuff. They can do some blending or maybe there's a particular sale or a particular end use market. But you know, really the vast majority of what we export isn't like super high quality, right? So if you can accomplish you know, kind of getting what you need with, with blending as little of that and not having to, let's, I'm gonna use the word overpay, which doesn't, implies that it isn't worth that, which isn't the case. You know, I'm not sure that it's gonna widen a whole lot more. Remember we got you know, those big stocks of hard red spring wheat in the US, they had some quality issues too, but I don't think the market perceives it as being as tight as one might think based on the, on the headlines. And I think prices probably would, to a certain degree, you know, be telling you that. So, but I don't think there's necessarily downside. I'm just not sure. I, I guess I wouldn't say that, oh, I'm waiting for, you know, there's going to be this massive premium building beyond what we're seeing today. I'm not sure that that's the case. Yeah. Where do you see uh, soybean prices in Manitoba this fall? Oh, man, soybean prices in Manitoba this fall. <clears throat> I guess I would put it to you this way. Um, like what would be available today, for example, ballpark that you would see in your area? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, you know, it's called $10. Like, like I'm, not, I'm not sure at this moment where we stand today that I'd be a whole lot more optimistic than that, to be honest with you. Now, uh, and, and so... You could, you could build a case, so I'm not very bullish on soybean futures, but, but the one thing about soybeans, it's kind of like it's like ground zero for all the, the, the political aspect in ag markets, right? So all of a sudden, you know, it, it wouldn't be beyond, uh, you know, the realm of, of, you know, possibility that suddenly China buys a whole bunch of U.S. and that's part of, you know, different things that are going on. You could spike the futures market higher. That would sort of drag us higher kicking and screaming, but I think basis levels probably eat up quite a bit of that unless we start getting some exports going. So if we can't get you know, some export traction going out of Western Canada, it's pretty hard to be 
you know, too optimistic, to be honest with you. So, you know, that's probably a reasonable, let's call it anchor as a bit of value, but I'm not sure we'd see a whole lot more upside without some weather problems or unless for some reason we can find some new export homes for it or, or that sort of thing. Yeah, it's, it's uh, from a price perspective, yeah, I'm not super optimistic. We just got some headwinds that are Canadian specific too, not just sort of the market, but it's kind of a, a prairie specific thing. You know, Ontario isn't having the same problems, but we're having some issues, so yeah. Is there any other questions? If not, uh, Jonathan, I'd like to take this opportunity on behalf of Manitoba Wheat and Barley Growers Association to give you this small token of our appreciation and uh, let's give them a round of applause for a good presentation. Good. Thank you very much.